This is David Hofmeister's Unwind Your Mind Back to God Read by Tarana Singh In today's episode we continue unlearning the world with book 2 In chapter 3 this is the last and final chapter 6 On duality and forgiveness part 2 The real world is achieved when you perceive the basis for forgiveness is quite real and fully justified. While you regard it as a gift unwarranted, it must uphold the guilt you would forgive. Unjustified forgiveness is attack. Text Chapter 30 Section 6 When we use the word attack, it conjures up images. The mind thinks that it knows what attack is. But there are many, many subtle forms of it that are not seen for what they are. The more you work with the course, the more you start to see that all judgment is attack. Because it denies the wholeness and the unity of mind. It is attack whenever the mind engages in judging or breaking apart. We are talking here about the ordering of thoughts and the hierarchy of illusions. It gets into very subtle realms. It is hard for the mind to grasp What preferring apple pie over cherry pie is a form of attack? You think, attack is what I see on the news every night. I know what attack is. Preferring cherry pie over apple pie has nothing to do with attack. But the Course is saying that it is an attack. There are all these hierarchies of preferences. Preferences in the way people look, or food preferences, or sexual preferences, climate preferences, visual preferences, music preferences. These are eco-configurations of what I call my version of reality, which is not reality at all. It is just my version of reality, the small self's version. That is why there seems to be conflict. There seem to be all these tiny, disparate versions of reality and they all seem to collide. That is why we have debates and opinions and arguments. The first chaotic law or the ego's law, is that the truth is different for everyone. Text Chapter 23, Section 2 To each his own. How many times have you heard that cliché? Or everybody is entitled to their own opinion. I see forgiveness as the complete relinquishment of judgment in the worldly sense. That is not to say that as a stepping stone the Holy Spirit is not judgmental or evaluative. It clearly states in the Course that the Holy Spirit is evaluative as long as you believe that you are in a maze of duality. There are choices to make in duality. Do I do this? Do I do that? Do I go here? Do I go there? Then the Holy Spirit is evaluative. He gives the mind what it can receive and guides the mind out of the belief that it is in the world of duality. But how can I truly let go and listen to the Holy Spirit's judgment if I want to hang on to my own version of reality, my own preferences, my own likes and dislikes and opinions. 
friend. For a while I had the idea of good confused with truth and the idea of bad with false. I would immediately evaluate things to see if they were good or bad, true or false. It recently occurred to me that bad has nothing to do with false and that good has nothing to do with truth. I have a problem seeing what is false in this world, except when I realize that everything I see is false and everything I do is false. Can you talk about good and bad, about this duality of good and evil? David We can talk about good and bad, beautiful and ugly. You could phrase it as desirable, undesirable, and pleasurable, painful. There are a lot of different ways to come at it. You can tell there is duality in all of those. There are two ends of the scale. In the deceived state, you cannot tell the difference between pleasure and pain. The deceived mind tries to teach itself its pains and joys are different and can be told apart. Text, Chapter 27, Section 8 In Lesson 12, Jesus tells you to look about yourself and list what you think you see using whatever descriptive terms happen to occur to you. He says, If terms which seem positive rather than negative occur to you, include them. For example, you might think of a good world or a satisfying world. If such terms occur to you, use them along with the rest. You may not yet understand why these nice adjectives belong in these exercises. But remember that a good world implies a bad one and a satisfying world implies an unsatisfying one. Workbook Lesson 12 There seems to be a general consensus that there are a lot of wonderful, beautiful, good things in this world and also that there are certain things which are bad or negative. Perhaps the belief is that if I can just forgive the negativity, then I will be left with what is good. Goodness, if we use it in the ultimate sense, is behind the veil of duality. It is when you cease to judge both ends of the spectrum of good and bad and lay aside all judgments that you are left with the truth. It is not by forgiving the negative or trying to give up all the negative judging. It is about giving up the belief that you even know what is good or bad. Do you see where this is going? We are transcending morality and ethics. All the disciplines that are preoccupied with what is good. This points to a very high place because admittedly most all religions and philosophies have come up with a lot of rules about good and bad. You have to be very careful about how you define and construct that. You are back into making the error real as soon as you categorize. As soon as you have good and bad, you are denying that it is all an illusion. If I think some behaviors are good and some are bad, how can it all be equally unreal? Are there some illusions that are better and some worse? When I say making it real, I mean giving reality to the projected world. 
Here we have the metaphysics of why we need to stop thinking we know what is good and bad. Because we are giving reality to the projected world by doing that. Friend, some people believe that negativity should be dealt with, done away with. I know people who do not want to talk about the news or even look at it. They do not want to read anything negative. They think that if they do not look at it, it will go away. No, it will just be further projected out. We must look at it. If we don't, then we are denying that that is our mind that projected it out there. That is my thinking that did that. I am still holding on to these thoughts because I am seeing it out there. I am seeing it on the news. If I just hang on to this beautiful and lovely nature and sunlight and the glorious illusions, I won't ever wake up. I will stay in this dream. David, it is about watching your thoughts and watching your thoughts and watching your thoughts. Just noticing the thoughts can be used in a helpful way and you may get to the point of getting clearer and clearer in your mind. You may get to the point where you may not want to watch the news. It may not be the thing that you are guided to do. It may not be what is most helpful for the whole sonship. But it is always about watching your thoughts. Whether it is during a movie, watching the news, or being with the in-laws, or at work. Whatever it is that you are doing. It really is a full-time job to watch your mind all the time. Friend, I did not realize it was my mind I was supposed to be watching. David, that is the first step. You have to watch these thoughts to begin with and then you have to stay aware. Friend, it is my dream and when I get identified with it and start arguing with someone or feel attacked, I have forgotten that I wrote the script and I am an actor in the play. I hope I can find Nelly step back. Wait a minute. This has no reality at all. I am giving it all the reality that it has. I bought into it. I identified with it. I think it is real. And it is real when I think it is real. David, the key word is identified. Jesus says in the Manual for Teachers, when he talks about the real meaning of sacrifice, self-condemnation is a decision about identity and no one doubts what he believes he is. He can doubt all things, but never this. Manual for Teachers, Section 13 Whatever you are identified with, you are in it with your whole being. All of our defense mechanisms arise out of identification with the space-time world of form and bodies. All emotions come with identification, with the illusion. As you begin to train your mind, you learn to see that rage is no different than a little twinge of frustration. You start to see the subtleties. When we trace the emotions back, we always find the identification with the personality. Friend, the body concept. David, that is where the defenses come in. The Course mentions the path of asceticism. asceticism. 
many have chosen to renounce the world while still believing its reality. Workbook Lesson 155 And in the next sentence, something more familiar in our modern-day age of technology and convenience is mentioned. Others have chosen nothing but the world, and they have suffered from a sense of loss still deeper. The world is like a playland of convenience and comfort with an I-can-do-whatever-I-want mentality. It can be very lulling. It can seem as though I have it pretty good. I have it better than earlier generations. Look at all the progress, conveniences and comforts. Convenience for what? Comfort for what? The body? The body is the centerpiece in all this progress. At some point, you start to think, wait a minute, I want to have a free mind and if my mind is identified and attached to the body, then how can I have a free mind and a free body? Do you want freedom of the body or freedom of the mind? For both you cannot have. Text, Chapter 22, Section 6 You want to get to the truth that is stable, that just is, beyond the good and bad. Everything that we perceive in this world can be used as symbols. Concepts can be used as stepping stones. The more you apply the course, the more you see the things of the world are merely symbolic. The more you withdraw your judgment, the more you allow the mind to open up and expand. Forgiveness is a concept. It is the biggest, most all-inclusive concept, metaphor, that there is. For it undoes all other concepts or metaphors. End of section.